Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about the introduction of the cochineal insect Dactylopius salonicus into South Australia to target the cactus uh, Opuntia monocantha. Um, this talk isn't going to introduce any really new science, rather I'm going to showcase the, uh, the uh, histor historical research that was done in the 1920s to highlight the, how the cost recovery of research on biocontrol is still being realised today. Um, I'll whiz through the plants and the insects I'll be talking about and talk a little bit about the project that I've been running for two years. Um, Opuntia cactus, uh, noted for or generalised as being um, flat, flattened stem segments that, um, or prickly pears, um, they are flattened stem segments that a, a jointed cactus and they're interesting that they are highly evolved and in the evolutionary scale of things they're highly advanced and highly um, oh, I'm going to move on <laughs> sorry guys uh, they're the most spatially widespread genus of the cactus family and one of the largest with 118 species and 10 naturally occurring hybrids Hybridisation is a common phenomenon in this genus, an important evolutionary activity in all Opuntioids. Their natural range is across the length of the Americas. Um, Opuntia monocantha, which is what the main talk is about, is from the southeast coast of South America, and it was first introduced into Australia in 1788, and that was with the first fleet that stopped in the port of Rio de Janeiro and picked up the the cactus and some cochineal insects with the intention of creating a dye industry. Uh, this is a photo taken from the Onca Pringa Gorge. Um, the, does it work? I'll give up on that. The, the, the cactus you can see there is standing about 8 to 10 metres tall. It's really in, impenetrated into the bush and very hard to manage. As I was saying about the evolution of the plant, it's, uh, it's got a very good um, ability to vegetatively propagate and each of those fruits hanging there has the capacity to drop to the ground and shoot and form a new plant. They do carry seeds but this will show you a fruit that's hit the ground that's three weeks old, uh, that fruit, and it's already shot a stem and will have roots into the ground. So this evolution makes them a very invasive weed. Uh, another cactus in my talk is the Opuntia stricta. This comes from the, the Gulf of Mexico region and the will cactus Opuntia robusta that's through the central highlands of Mexico. Um, a bit about cochineal insects. They're a pathogenic feeder on cactus and they produce a carmanic acid which is red in colour and used as a dye for centuries and becomes the, the reason that we learnt about this relationship as a biocontrol. That's a photograph of a female cochineal insect. Uh, she produces a white waxy substance which she creates a home and has fine filaments that you can see in the bottom of the photograph which are used for wind assisted dispersal. There on the other hand is the male, he's about two millimetres long in that photograph and he has wings and can actively fly. So through the, the species of Dactylopius in my talk, uh, Cocos is the one that's used for dye production. This has been sort of uh, hand selected over centuries in South America. Whereas Dactylopius apuntiae and Dactylopius salonicus are really just uh, pathogens. Okay, a bit about the history. Uh, it was only by incidents or incidental chance that in trying to create a dye industry they discovered that the cochineal insects uh, will kill the cactus and in the early 20th century there were big problems on the east coast where there was over 24 million hectares of land infested with uh, Opuntia stricta and someone got a bright idea in 1913 and introduced the insect Dactylopius salonicus onto that population hoping to control it. It was uh, very effective, effective in controlling Opuntia monocantha not so much on the Opuntia, Opuntia stricta. After that we, in Australia, invested a lot of money and sent entomologists to South America looking for insects. They came back with over 56 insects 
Uh, a lot of these were different strains of the Dactylopius opuntiae, and one of these was very effective in controlling the opuntia stricta, and that with another insect called Cactoblastus cactorium. Um, they brought the opuntia stricta under control, and there's a lot of memory about this, but the actual detail has sort of been lost over time through us practitioners, and uh, that's sort of um, why I've chosen a, a photo-based uh, narrative for this is to really sort of Im impact on the need to share this information to the future to make sure we don't get stuck uh, as weeds come under control through biocontrol that we don't forget how to reinvigorate them in the future. Uh, so where did we get to now? So this happened nearly 100 years ago and about five years ago South Australia was looking to see how they could deal with the, the growing cactus problem here. This is a photo taken from the Flinders Ranges by the Parachilna, uh, Blimmin and Parachilna Pest Plant Control Group who've lent it to me and the, the sequence of photos to come, just showing how difficult the problem in the Flinders were. Uh, at this time, South Australia led the nomination to see Opuntioid cactus listed as weeds of national significance. And uh, that happened in 2012-2013. Uh, this is just for this memory of everyone. Uh, this is how they were dealing with the cactus back then. Abseiling down cliff lines in stem injecting plants. Very cost effective, very labour intensive. Uh, at the same time they were investigating the, the use of cochineal to control cactus. And um, which they did very effectively. Now us in AMLR uh, we're looking at these examples and thinking that that was a great tool and we would like to try and use it on our infestations of Apuntia monocantha on the Gula and Onkaparunga rivers. And this is just some basic maps of how far the extent is of the, the problems along these watercourses. This was the effect of the cochineal was having on the cactus up in the Flinders Ranges. So we tried this in AMLR and uh, it didn't really work. Uh, we held a forum in 2013 and it came to light that we had the wrong species of cochineal insects and we needed to find this Dactylopia salonicus and uh, I went around and did that and I found an entomologist in New South Wales who sent me a small parcel which we, we reared in uh, wheelie bins actually in the sheds at Watanga House. This is a very low budget project and um, look the temperatures were really hot over that summer but uh, the insects multiplied very rapidly and I took that little esky to turn into three wheelie bins within a couple of months and we put them out in two nursery sites, one down at, Gore, uh, one at Port Elliot near Gore and one on the Gawler River. Uh, now my site out at Gawler River um, ended up with a couch being dumped on it or a whole lounge suite and the council came and cleaned that up and, and annihilated that site so I lost one. Um, but I went back to the Port Elliot site and collected a whole heap more material and stuck it in the glass house at the Watunga Botanic Gardens late in winter. And uh, what, we, what we found in the glass house was the temperature was about 10 degrees above ambient. And uh, based on a, on a study from um, Sullivan, he showed that the the prime temperature for uh, reproduction, or sorry, temperature as temperature increases, reproduction in increases, but over a certain maximum temperature, mortality sets in, and and uh, and that the optimum was between 26 and 30, and we found this in the glass house, and insects grew very well and sustained their populations in a healthy manner. Uh, that was consistent with the Sullivan study. Um, in terms of how the, we implement this in the field, as I showed earlier with the photo of the female, she disperses by crawling, uh, finding a place to, to bury her mouth part into a, a cactus and there she'll sit. If uh, she doesn't find a location, she'll climb to the top of the plant and disperse into the wind. 
It's a very docile method of dispersal, and in terms of us in the field as implementing a biocontrol program, uh, the help of manual relocation is very important. Um, also that there's warming, artificial warming of the insects in the glass houses in late winter stimulated their reproduction and had them in a healthier state for field releases. Uh, also we sort of decided that the microclimate that we released them into was very important. So here in the Onkaparinga Gorge we'd chosen a north facing uh, rock face we're just above the water line, so it's quite a deep gorge and quite shadowed through winter, but we're hoping in this side it will maintain that, that drier, warmer conditions for longer and provide a better habit uh, local conditions for the insects to reproduce and establish themselves. Um, what we also decided, and there's potential, uh, certainly from the, the wheelie bin experience, was that keeping by taking the pads and releasing them too late in the autumn when the insects were dormant because they were cold uh, would mean the host material would deteriorate and leave a, a poor environment for the insects to, to be living on. So we're holding off all releases through winter and planning them all for uh, spring. Uh, this is the site at the Onkaringa Gorge that one of, well, one of the, the test release sites. So in the background you can see what a normal plant would look like. It's slightly infected and that's the impact that the insects have. And this really is, is the cost benefit realisation that we get this sort of level of control with the insects for literally no cost. Uh, this is what we'll be targeting next. Obviously the cliffs aren't as high as in the Flinders Ranges but we're hoping to get that under control within a couple of years with very minimal effort and, uh, and that concludes my talk.